Amendment rights to the citizens when these veterans are buried in VA cemeteries. Now the veterans have won a battle against the government that wanted to deny them the American freedoms they fought for in lands. I, w I will not. Offered one amendment and reading another, but we'd like to straighten that out if we could. I'm not, I'm, I will reclaim my time. I'm discussing both amendments at the same time. Oh, okay. Thank you. We did not understand and a, that. And a function of saving time. Yeah, we uh, we were for that. <laughs> <laughs> Reclaiming my time, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from oh, Texas okay. controls the time. Uh, a fundamental problem in the Houston case was the director of the cemetery and not the veterans. She did not understand the needs of veterans because she was not a veteran herself. And according to the veterans uh, of foreign war, she dis disrespected the veterans and their most fundamental rights. The amendment number four is simple. It says that any new hires of cemetery directors must be veterans. Eighty percent of current cemetery directors are veterans. On the application, when they apply to be a director, they must state whether they're a veteran or not. So clearly the Veterans Administration agrees the cemetery directors should be veterans themselves. This amendment would not force the remaining 20 percent that are not veterans to be fired. It would say that if the Veterans Administration is going to hire new directors, they will be veterans. Our veterans need to know the directors of the cemeteries understand what veterans and their families go through. They are the ones who best understand the needs of veterans and their time of grief, so they need to be veterans. And I uh, yield back the balance of my time. And the gentleman yields back. Gentleman I, I, I raise a point of order. Uh, which amendment do, are we, are we, uh, is before the House? Action, the clerk will reread the amendment. Thank you. Amendment offered by Mr. Poe of Texas. No. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following section. None of the funds made available by this act may be used to hire a director of a national cemetery who is not a veteran. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, ex agree to the amendment and accept it. Uh, I think it's important. Had the funeral director, had the cemetery director in Houston been a veteran, this problem never would have arisen. And uh, I also thank the gentleman for bringing both of these amendments uh, to the uh, floor tonight. Uh, I personally witnessed the cemetery director interfering with uh, the uh, funeral services of veterans. It was outrageous. Uh, just, just, just absolutely unacceptable. And I thank the gentleman for his amendments. And, and uh, speaking on this amendment first, uh, I have no objection and will accept this amendment. What part does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? I move to strike the last word and to speak the in opposition to, to the amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have great empathy uh, for the concerns that the gentleman from Texas has raised uh, in his discussion about the amendment uh, on hiring a National Cemetery Administration director. Uh, but I, I, I just want to want to address some of them because I don't think it's good, good policy and I don't think it will make for the best uh, management and operation of our national cemeteries. Uh, employees of the National Cemetery Administration are proud to serve veterans and to serve veterans' families at that time of need and to do it with dignity and with compassion. Uh, while the National Cemetery Administration has one of the highest percentages of veterans' employees of any federal agency, 79 percent of the employees and 80 percent of its cemetery directors are veterans, uh, the desire and the passion to serve our nation's veterans is not limited to just veterans. Uh, VA National Cemeteries are nationally recognized for their commitment to excellence, top-rated customer satisfaction. Since 2001, the National Cemetery Administration has earned the American Customer Satisfaction Index's rating as the top performing public or private organization in the country. This continues to be achieved by dedicated uh, National Cemetery Administration employees, both veterans and non-veterans. Who says a non-veteran cannot be patriotic and support the United States of America? If such an amendment passes, who would it impact? Most of our non-veteran cemetery directors have family ties with veterans. For example, one of our long-serving national cemetery directors had a father who served in the U.S. Army during World War II and saw combat in the Philippines, a brother who served as an Army infantryman in Vietnam, a husband who served in the Marine Corps during the Vietnam War, and most recently a son-in-law in the Marines who served two tours overseas during Operation Desert Storm. 
This bill will result in a child, a sibling, or a spouse of a veteran losing his or her job or being denied the opportunity for a promotion. These individuals supported their family members as they put their lives on the land for our nation, and now they wish to contribute to continue to honor and care for the graves of veterans in their final resting place. Uh, VA follows all federal laws and OPM regulations regarding hiring preference for eligible veterans. This legislation would make VA vulnerable to litigation by the displaced cemetery directors through the Merit Systems Protection Board. Uh, the NCA requires all new national cemetery directors to have completed a one-year intensive internship program that provides comprehensive training in all aspects of cemetery operations and management. Even if qualified veterans could be hired within, 100 and days to, uh, within 180 days to fill these uh, critical positions, they would be coming in without the specific knowledge and skills to effectively run a cemetery to meet the needs of our veterans and their grieving families. I think this amendment is well-intentioned, but uh, I don't think that it would accomplish what is, what is desired, and I think ultimately it will end up with uh, chaos in our personnel system regarding our national cemeteries, and I urge that uh, uh, this amendment uh, be defeated. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. This is the gentleman from New Jersey seek recognition. Strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I'd like to yield to the gentleman from Texas. Thank the gentleman for yielding. I just want to uh, clarify one comment the ranking member made. Uh, this bill would, this amendment would not require the firing of anybody. It's future hires of uh, the veteran cemetery directors. Uh, so I just want to make that clear. That wouldn't put anybody out of work. And this specific problem at the Houston Cemetery was all centered around the directors in sensitivity to veterans and one of the problems that came out during all of the litigation was she had no relationship to vet veterans, didn't understand veterans, she wasn't a veteran and therefore that's why this legislation is important but it would not require the firing of anybody. It's about future directors and I yield back to the gentleman. Chairman, I yield back to balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose? The I move to strike the requisite number of, of words. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Uh, the poll amendment states none of the funds may be made available by this act may be used for a director of a national cemetery who after the date that is 100 days, whatever, however he rephrased it, it, it according to the VA, uh, compliance with this provision would be extremely disruptive to the NCA operations by requiring 20 percent of VA national cemetery directors to lose their current jobs for no other reason than that they are not a veteran. That is unfair. And the gentleman uh, may have a grievance about one funeral director, but you can't take this out on the rest of these people who are doing a good job. So I would hope that we would defeat this ill-considered uh, amendment. And yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Question is on the amendment offered by the. Can he amend it? Recognition. Can he amend it? Yes, you can ask unanimous consent to amend your amendment to add the word no. Right. For what purpose the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? I ask unanimous consent to uh, amend the amendment to insert the word new. New hire. Before the word hire. So then it's clear. The gentleman will need to submit the modification to right. the desk. As I understand it, uh, would the gentleman yield? Yes. Is that none of the funds may be available by this act may be used to hire a new director? of a national cemetery who is not a veteran? That is correct. The gentleman is correct. Thank you for clarifying that.
okay, you're the boss. You know, you wanna... For by Mr. Poe of Texas. Insert after A, new, before director. Is there objection to the modification? Yes. Gentleman from Georgia. No, sorry, no objection. Just reserving the right to object. The gentleman is recognized on his reservation. Well, you got to ask him where that is. Is it not true that if we adopt this uh, amendment for new hires, that it still restricts the option of getting the best possible uh, manager for the cemetery? Well, Jim, um, yield? Yes, I will. It will require that it be, the person be a veteran for all new hires of a director of the cemetery. You are correct. That's what I thought. Thank you. I'm withdraw his I withdraw my objection. Jim withdraws his reservation. Objection to the modification. Without objection, so ordered. The amendment is modified. Who seeks recognition? The question is on the amendment. It's modified, offered by the gentleman from Texas. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Desk. The, agreement, uh, the amendment is agreed to. The clerk will, uh, will designate uh, Number five. the amendment. Number five. We're going to save time. Yes. The gentleman is correct. <laughs> clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Poe of Texas at the end of the bill before the short title insert the following section. None of the funds made available by this act may be used to prohibit a veteran service organization that is participating in the funeral or memorial service of a veteran from reciting any words as part of such service or memorial. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Once again, I thank uh, Chairman Culberson for his work on this uh, situation that occurred at the Veterans Cemetery in, in Houston last, last year that has been resolved on one specific case. Uh, this amendment does something very simple. It ensures that the First Amendment rights of veterans and their families will not be violated by anyone at burial services at our national cemeteries. Free, it's a free speech issue and it would not allow the what has occurred in the past, the speech police of the Veterans Administration to control the words of those that attend burials of our veterans. So I urge support of this amendment, which will ensure the constitutional rights that are in the First Amendment to those that will be buried in the future at all of our national cemeteries. And I yield back. Yields back. For what purpose the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? We have no objection. For what purpose the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Strongly support the gentleman's amendment and thank him for bringing it to the floor tonight and urge its adoption. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. For what purpose the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Runyon of New Jersey, page 66, after line 10, insert the following new section, section 519. None of the funds made available by this act may be used to modify, maintain, or manage a structure, building, or barracks for a person, unit, or mission of the armed forces or Department of Defense outside the normal tour or duty, restationing, or authorized base closure and realignment process. The gentleman from New, Jer New Jersey is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be really brief. Uh, my, my amendment states that none of the funds made available by this act could be used to do an informal base realignment and closure. As you may be aware, the Senate version of the National Defense Authorization Act calls for an independent commission that would help determine the Air Force's force structure. I know that many members of this Congress, of this chamber, also want Congress to have our say on this issue. And my amendment will help ensure that we do. I thank the uh, chairman and the members of the subcommittee for working with me on this important amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Does any member seek recognition? 
The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New Jersey. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Flores of Texas. At the end of the bill, before the short title, add the following new section. Section 519, none of the funds made available by this act shall be available to enforce Section 526 of the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, Public, Public Law 110-140, 42 U.S.C. 17142. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I rise to offer an amendment which addresses another misguided and restrictive federal regulation. Section 526 of the Energy Independence and Security Act prevents federal agencies from entering into contracts for the procurement of a fuel unless its life cycle greenhouse gas emissions are less than or equal to emissions from an equivalent conventional fuel produced from conventional petroleum sources. In summary, my amendment would stop the government from enforcing this ban on all federal agencies funded by the Milcon VA bill. The initial purpose of Section 526 was to stifle the Defense Department's plans to buy and develop coal-based or coal-to-fuel, co excuse me, coal-to-liquids jet fuel. This restriction was based on the opin opinion of some environmentalists that coal-based jet fuel might produce more greenhouse gas emissions than traditional petroleum. We must ensure that our military has adequate fuel resources and that it can efficiently re rely on domestic and more stable sources of fuel. But unfortunately, Section 526's ban on, ban on fuel choice now affects all federal agencies, not just the Defense Department. This is why I'm offering this amendment again today to the Milcon VA appropriations bills. Federal agencies should not be burdened with wasting their time studying fuel restrictions when there is a simple fix, and that's to not restrict their fuel choices based on extreme environmental views, policies, and misguided regulations like Section 526. With increasing competition for energy and fuel resources and the continued volatility and instability in the Middle East, it is now more important than ever for our country to become more energy independent and to further develop and produce our domestic energy resources. Placing limits on federal agencies' fuel resources is an unacceptable precedent to set in regard to America's energy policy and independence and our national security. Mr. Chair, Section 526 makes our nation more dependent on Middle East oil. Stopping the impact of Section 526 will help us to promote American energy, improve the American economy, and create American jobs. Let's remember the following facts about Section 526. It increases our reliance on Middle Eastern oil. It hurts our military readiness, our national security, and our energy security. It also prevents the potential increased use of, from so, of some sources of safe, clean, and efficient American oil and gas. It increases the cost of American food and energy. It hurts American jobs and the American economy. And last, but certainly not least, it costs our taxpayers more of their hard-earned dollars. In some circles, there's a misconception that my amendment somehow prevents the federal government and the military from being able to, to produce and use alternative fuels. But Mr. Chairman, this viewpoint is categorically false. All my amendment does is to allow the purchasers of these fuels to acquire the fuels that best and most efficiently meet their needs. I offered a similar amendment to the CJS Appropriations Bill, and it passed with strong bipartisan support. My friend Mr. Conaway also had language added to the Defense Authorization Bill to exempt the Defense Department from this burdensome regulation. I urge my colleagues to support passage of this common sense amendment. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Rise and strike the last word. I rise in opposition. Recognized for five minutes. I rise in opposition to the gentleman's amendment. Uh, Section 526 of uh, uh, the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007 is intended to ensure that the environmental costs from the use of alternative fuels are at least no worse than the fuels in use today. Uh, it requires that the federal government do no more harm when it comes to global climate change than it does today through the use of unconventional fuels. Um, Section 526 precludes the use of fuels such as coal to liquids as well as unconventional petroleum fuels such as tar sands and oil shale unless advanced technologies such as carbon sequestration are used to mitigate their greenhouse gas emissions. 
uh, the Carl era as a domestic production could be achieved with carbon sequestration. Uh, further, the EIA predicts that these alternative fuels may well take decades to develop and that the additional fuel production capacity of these alternatives is unlikely to exceed 10 percent of the fuel supply by 2030. Uh, a number of the reports have concluded that the potential adverse national security impacts of climate change, such as political unrest due to famines and droughts, may w very well be severe, and these consequences can outweigh the security benefits of domestic production of these fuels. Uh, the Department of Defense alone is the largest single energy consumer in the world. It consumes approximately as much energy as the nation of Nigeria. Its leadership in this area is critical to any credible approach to dealing with energy security issues in a way that will not result in dangerous global climate change. This prohibition provides an opportunity for DOD to play a substantial role in spurring innovation to produce alternative fuels which will not worsen the global ch climate change. I urge members to vote no on this amendment. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose, the gentleman from Texas seek recognition. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of the gentleman's amendment. It makes, uh, uh, it makes sense. For five minutes. We accepted this amendment. Uh, it passed the House last year, and I'm happy to yield to my friend from Texas for any further comments he'd like to make. Well, I thank the gentleman from Texas. Now, let's restate what this amendment does. It prevents Section 526 from restricting the fuel choices available to our military and to our federal agencies. It doesn't say that they cannot go ahead and develop alternative fuel sources. Now, we can debate whether or not that's appropriate. The Navy recently made a purchase of biofuel for $27 a gallon, which was $5, excuse me, five to six times more expensive than traditional fuels. Now, we can debate if that's the appropriate use of taxpayer money. I think it's wrong. This amendment would not affect that whatsoever. It, all it says is the Navy or the, mili the other branches of the military or any federal agency affected by MILCON VA can buy whatever fuel it deems is most appropriate for its needs. Now I yield back to the gentleman from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I urge adoption of the amendment. The gentleman yields back. And I yield back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. First, does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Webster of Florida. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following section. None of the funds made available by this act may be used for the salary or compensation of a director of construction and facilities management of the Department of Veterans Affairs or an individual acting as such director who does not meet the qualifications for such position required under Section 312AB of Title 38, United States Code. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my amendment is simple. It requires the Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, Veteran Affairs to allow and follow existing law and insist on having an experienced director of construction and facilities management. All it requires is the holder of this position have an, an, a, a degree in uh, architecture or engineering and professional experience in construction project management. Now, many people have heard of this position, but it carries enormous responsibility, not only for the, for the stewardship of our tax dollars, but also for the ensuring that our veterans have the facilities necessary for health care and medical treatment we promised them and they earned. The VA manages over 5,000 buildings nationwide, and according to GAO, has nearly 70 ongoing major construction projects around the country, 33 of which are major medical facilities. Of these 33, many have experienced considerable uh, overruns in cost and scheduling delays. For the four of the largest projects under construction are full-service hospitals designed to provide health care to the hundreds of thousands of American veterans. The VA will spend an estimated $3 billion on these four facilities. One of these sites is in Orlando. The construction of the Orlando VAMC has been a classic example of government waste and inefficiency. 
The VA broke ground on the site in 2008 with a scheduled completion date of 2010. An estimated completion date now has been pushed back well into 2013. Several GAO reports and House Veterans Affairs Committee hearings have sought to determine the root cause of these problems. However, it's increasingly clear that the lack of expertise on the part of the Department of Construction and Facilities Management within the VA bears responsibility. The VA has violated public law by ignoring the required qualifications to occupy a position that oversees these projects. The result is a cost to taxpayers of an additional $1.1 billion on the four largest projects alone and multiple year delays in health care services to our veterans. The qualifications are shockingly simple. For a position that oversees the construction of veterans health care facilities that costs billions of dollars. An individual who holds the position of Director of Construction and Facilities Management under current law must meet two qualifications. Number one, hold an undergraduate or master's degree in architectural design and engineering, and number two, have professional experience in the area of construction and project management. Mike's, my amendment simply requires that the funds used to hire this person would meet that criteria. The Director of Construction and Facilities Management will potentially oversee as much as $15 billion in construction and repairs over the next five years. We owe it to our nation's heroes to have qualified, experienced people behind these critical projects. I urge my colleagues to vote yes on this Webster Amendment and ensure that not only the valuable taxpayer dollars are appropriately managed, but that our veterans have access to high-quality health care facilities that they deserve. Yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. Senior member, seek time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. What purpose does the gentleman from Arizona seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment, designate the amendment. Amendment number eight, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Franks of Arizona. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise today in support of this amendment to H.R. 5854, the Military Construction and Veterans Affairs and Related Agencies Appropriations Act of 2013. I also want to thank my colleagues, Mr. Gosar, uh, Mr. Steve King, and Mr. Amosh, for joining me in co-sponsoring this amendment. Mr. Chairman, my amendment would ensure that no funds made available by H.R. 5854 could be used to implement, administer, or enforce the Davis-Bacon Act requirements for government contracts. Mr. Chairman, the Davis-Bacon Act is an anachronistic law that was enacted during the Great Depression to prevent wayfaring contractors from lowballing local construction bids. The sponsors of this act originally intended for it to discriminate against non-unionized black workers in favor of white workers belonging to white-only unions. This vestigial remnant of the Jim Crow era has no place in our military construction conduct tracks and should be abandoned. Furthermore, the Davis-Bacon Act results in billions of wasted taxpayer dollars every year. The act requires federal construction contractors to pay their wor workers higher government-mandated wages, which would be as much as one and a half times greater than their basic pay rate. This results in artificially high costs of construction, Mr. Chairman, which are ultimately shouldered by American taxpayers. Contractors wishing to offer a lower bid would still be required by law to pay their employers the higher government-mandated uh, wage and file a weekly report of the wages paid to each worker. This has a particularly negative effect on small businesses as they are often unable to compete due to the Davis-Bacon wage and benefits requirements, which reduces competition and further inflates contract rates. Moreover, Mr. Chairman, Davis-Bacon was, en was enacted before the Fair Labor Standards Act and the National Labor uh, Relations Act, and according to G GAO, these acts have rendered Davis-Bacon obsolete and unnecessary. There are a number of laws passed by this body that protect construction workers without the discriminatory intent and effect of Davis-Bacon. 
During this time of fiscal austerity and responsibility, Congress must do all it can to lower federal contract costs and decrease the burden on American taxpayers. This amendment is, attend attempted, is an attempt to stop the hemorrhage of wasteful spending and rein in our debt. And I urge my colleagues to support this amendment that would ensure no funds are made available by H.R. 5854 that could be used to implement, administer, or enforce the wasteful Davis Basic Bacon Act, and I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, uh, this is a very, very ill conceived uh, amendment, and uh, I must uh, stand in opposition to it. Uh, the Davis Bacon Act requires that workers on federally funded construction projects be paid no less than the wages paid in the community for similar work. It requires that every contract for construction in which the federal government is a party in excess of $2,000 contain a provision defining the minimum wages paid to various classes of laborers and mechanics. Uh, this is a pretty simple concept, and it's a fair one. What the Davis-Bacon Act does is to protect the government as well as the workers in carrying out the policy of paying decent wages on government contracts. I'd like to just mention quickly that Davis-Bacon has no effect on the total cost of construction. Study after study reveals productivity makes up for any additional labor costs, essentially eliminating any cost savings if the law was repealed. But this amendment seeks to prevent federal agencies from administering these requirements in statute. Let me give you a few examples of how this poorly thought out proposal could actually play out in the real world if it's enacted into law. The amendment, as it's written, could prevent federal agencies that use funds through this legislation from monitoring, investigating, transmitting conformances, and providing compliance assistance to existing Davis-Bacon covered contracts that were awarded prior to this funding legislation. Contractors requesting H-2B visas could conceivably request non-U.S. workers receive permits for employment at wage rates not in concert with the Davis-Bacon wages rates for that locality. Procurement agencies may not be able to proceed with the award of contracts that were solicited in the prior fiscal period but awarded under this funding legislation. During the period covered by this funding, bidders could use wages as a method of undercutting the locally established wage rates for that community that might promote the use of workers from different geographic areas. The amendment could prevent federal agencies that use money from this appropriation from advising state, local, and other grant recipients of DBA application to federally assisted programs that would otherwise be subject to the DBA provisions. Uh, this is not responsible legislation. It's not responsible govern governing. And uh, I urge the defeat of this amendment. Uh, and I, I yield back. Back? Yeah. Gentleman from Texas. Uh, I rise in, in support of the gentleman's amendment. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. And, and want to say, it, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, and I think much of this has been said, so we won't belabor it, but the state of Texas is a right-to-work state. There are very few, if any, labor unions in the state of Texas. And we have them in a few industries, but not many. And, and uh, we have to be good stewards uh, the taxpayers' precious dollars, and uh, the gentleman from Arizona's amendment makes good sense. We should pay the free market wage. We should not force taxpayers to pay an artificially high union wage when a free market wage is available and you can get uh, a job done well at a far better price. That just makes common sense and I urge adoption of the gentleman's amendment. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Washington seek recognition? Uh, I move to strike the requisite number of words. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Uh, let me just clear up a couple things, especially what the gentleman from uh, Texas just had to say, the chairman. Uh, this may be something that will be hard for him to believe, but this is, uh, as I understand it, from the Labor Department. A Davis Bacon wage usually is not a union wage. The Davis-Bacon prevailing wage is based upon surveys of wages and benefits actually played, paid to various job classifications of construction workers, uh, example iron workers, in the community with regard, without regard to union membership. 
according to the Department of Labor, a whopping 72% of the prevailing wage rates issued in 2000 were based upon non-union wage rates. A union wage prevails only if the DOL survey determines that the local wage is paid to more than 50% of the workers in the job classification. So 72% of these prevailing wages are non-union. I'm sure the gentleman from Texas and the gentleman from Arizona uh, are, are thrilled to hear that. Uh, and, you know, sometimes the facts are revealing. So again, we have defeated this amendment over and over and over again. Uh, I urge the House to defeat the Franks Amendment this evening and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arizona. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Mr. Chairman, I request a yeas and nays. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arizona will be postponed. What purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Stearns of Florida. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following section. None of the funds made available by this act may be used by the Secretary of Veterans Affairs to pay a performance award under Section 5384 of Title V, United States Code. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not going to take the full five minutes. Uh, my amendment is pretty simple. It uh, will prohibit funds from being paid bonuses to employees that are classified as senior executive services. Um, and what we found when we looked at this um, the Veterans Affairs Committee held a hearing on this on the budget in February of this year and the Secretary of the VA testified that their budget request was held accountable for the program results and of course one of the issues that came up Mr. Chairman was the enormous bonuses and awards that were given out to VA employees and I think like many of us here in the House we're concerned about bonuses when we have so much problems in this economy high unemployment and also we have a unmanageable backlog of uh, cases, extremely long wait for our veterans to see mental health professionals. And of course, the VA has a history of poor contracting process and oversight. For example, at the Miami VA Health Center, veterans may have to have been exposed to HIV AIDS are due to poor sterilization procedures down there. And to cite these poor records, are giving out huge bonuses for simple things like suggestions, uh, foreign language award, uh, travel savings incentives, referral bonuses. Uh, in fact, uh, on recruitment, re relocation, retention alone, almost 60,000 recipients received over 450,000 in cash bonuses. Uh, so my simple amendment is saying enough is enough. What we want to do is say all of government should make a sacrifice, and particularly the VA, if they're giving out these huge bonuses. Uh, why don't they cut back on their senior, senior employees uh, we're not saying anybody other than... Guild? Yes. Um, could we work out an agreement here that we could take the savings from the gentleman's amendment and use that to pay the workers the, the, five, the half of 1% uh, raise that is denied in this? Is there, a, is there a way we could well, work this I, out? I, I thank the gentleman for suggestions. I'm just going to go with my amendment at this point and uh, having... Uh, uh, an opportunity to look this over. I think uh, we've talked to the Veterans Committee and we think it's a viable amendment. I think certainly as we move into the conference we can look at what you're suggesting for right now. I just would like to... Uh, uh, I appreciate the gentleman yielding. Yeah. So with that, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. Opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. With Mr. Chairman, can I ask a recorded vote on that? Oh. No? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Okay. You're good. I'm good. Yeah. You're good. Does the gentleman I, withdraw his request? I withdraw. Yeah. The amendment is agreed to. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee do now rise. The question is on the motion that the committee rise. All those in favor say aye. All those say no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Accordingly, the committee rises. Okay. Go over there.
Mr. Speaker, the Committee of the Whole House and the State of the Union, having had under consideration H.R. 5854, directs me to report that it has come to no resolution thereon. The Chair of the Committee on the Whole House and the State of the Union reports that the Committee has had under consideration H.R. 5854 and has come to no resolution thereon. The Chair lays before the House a communication. The Honorable the Speaker, House of Representatives, Sir, this is to notify you formally, pursuant to Rule 8 of the Rules of the House of Representatives, that I have been served with a subpoena for testimony issued by the Superior Court for the State of North Carolina, Surrey County, in connection with a criminal prosecution currently pending before that court. After consultation with the Office of General Counsel, I have determined that because the subpoena is not material and relevant, compliance with the subpoena is inconsistent with the privileges and precedents of the House. Signed sincerely, Virginia Fox, Member of Congress. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask the unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days to which to revise and extend their remarks and exclude extraneous material in H.R. 5325, and then I may include tabular material on the same. Without objection, so ordered. Just wait one second, Brian. Just one second. Okay, sir, whenever you're ready. Mr.
Pursuant to House Resolution 667 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House in the Committee of the Whole House on, on the State of the Union for the consideration of H.R. 5325. The Chair appoints the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall, to preside over the Committee of the Whole. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House and the State of the Union for consideration of H.R. 5325, which the Clerk will report by title. A bill making appropriations for energy and water development and related agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2013, and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is considered read the first time. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Freelingheisen, and the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Bisklowski, each will control 30 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's my honor to bring the fiscal year 2013 energy and water bill before the full House. Before I begin my, my remarks, let me thank the full chairman, Mr. Rogers, as well as the ranking member, Mr. Dix, for their support of a very open process. I'd also like to thank my ranking member, Congressman Pete Vesklowski, for his dedication to our joint mission and our close working relationship. The bill is stronger for his input and knowledge. I'd also like to thank the committee staff, our clerk, Rob Blair, Joe Levin, Lorraine Heckenberg, Angie Giacarlo, Perry Yates and Trevor Higgins. On the minority side, I'd like to thank Tanya Burkham. I'd also like, like to thank my personal staff, Nancy Fox and Katie Hazlett, and Mr. Viskovsky's personal staff in the form of Joe DeVoe. Mr. Chairman, the Energy and Water Appropriations Bill supports programs critical to our nation's security, safety, and economic competitiveness. Our recommendation prioritizes investments in our nuclear security enterprise, programs to address gasoline prices and opportunities to advance American competitiveness, including the key role of the Army Corps of Engineers. The bill for fiscal year 2013 totals $32.1 billion. Security and funding, funding is increased by $275 million over last year, while non-security funding is cut by $188 million. Mr. Chairman, there are no earmarks in this legislation. We also reclaim most unused funds from previous Congresses, so this bill actually cuts spending by $623 million below last year, forcing our agencies down to more appropriate sizes and to operate with less money. The only significant increases over last year's level are to nuclear security and to develop a true all-of-the-above energy strategy. We also provide more funding to the core including a billion dollars for the Harvard Maintenance Fund projects. The recommendation also fully funds weapon activities to ensure that the Secretary of Energy has the investment he needs to certify to the President that our nuclear stockpile is reliable. We have also heard from the public's frustration about stimulus fund investments into failed energy projects. This bill will remove the Energy Department, Department back to its core responsibilities to serve Americans by pr protecting their security and improving our energy independence. Our bill will help improve that independence by sustaining fossil and nuclear energy research development, the latter of which leads, is leading to investments in new nuclear power plants and developing small modular reactors. And unlike the President, we have always considered clean coal to be part of our national energy security. At the same time, the Department of Energy's energy programs are cut by nearly $600 million, or 6% 6, 6 by reducing programs which receive the largest of the largely failed so-called stimulus program. No funding is provided for Solandra-like loan guarantee programs in our bill. All of our constituents are wrestling with how to pay for higher gasoline bills on limited budgets. This bill does not provide a quick fix since there is little that the Department can do in its programs to immediately change oil supply and demand. However, the bill provides over $100 billion, $36 million over fiscal year 2012, to strengthen the Department of Energy's programs addressing the causes and impacts of higher gasoline prices down the road. Within this, 
The recommendation funds a new program to promote shale oil recovery. If we could fully use this resource, our country's reserves could equal all global conventional reserves. This would make a major dent in oil prices and reduce our dependency on foreign oil. Additionally, scientific research at the Department of Energy strengthens Americans, American competitiveness and enables true breakthroughs in the energy sector, and the bill preserves and protects it. The bill also protects public safety and keeps America literally open for business by providing $4.8 billion for the Army Corps of Engineers, $83 million above the request and $88 million below fiscal year 2012. As in fiscal year 2012, our bill maintains the constitutional role of Congress in the appropriations process by ensuring that all worthy Corps of Engineers projects have a chance to compete for funding. The bill provides $324 million in addition to the President's requested projects, investing in navigation and flood control, activities most critical to public safety, jobs, and our economy. Finally, a word about Yucca Mountain. The recommendation includes $25 million for Yucca Mountain with language prohibiting activities which keep that facility from being usable in the future. The recommendation also denies funding for the Blue Ribbon Commission activities which need legislative authorization. Research and development activities to support Yucca are permitted. This will ensure that we keep Congress in the driver's seat for nuclear waste policy. Mr. Chairman, this is a tight, fiscally conservative bill which funds critical national security, jobs, and infrastructure priorities while helping to fight future gasoline price increases. This bill deserves our members' support, and I look forward to an open and full discussion and open process, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Indiana. Appreciate the recognition. Mr. Chairman, I would yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentlemen's recognized for such time. Uh, I would like to begin by expressing my appreciation to Chairman Freeling Heisen for his efforts to be inclusive and transparent in drafting this legislation. The process has been collegial, and the Chairman has ensured that the Energy and Water Subcommittee continues this tradition of bipartisanship and cooperation. I would like to join the Chairman in thanking the other members of the subcommittee and also all of their staffs for their exceptionally good and dedicated work. And finally, this bill could not have been written without the dedication, hard work, and sound judgment of our committee staff, and the Chairman has kindly enumerated them by name. Given the constrained allocation that the subcommittee was dealt, I believe that Chairman Frelinghuysen has crafted a good bill. While I hope that we can modify some elements of the bill going forward, I would observe that our differences are marginal. As the Chairman mentioned in his remarks, the allocation for the Energy and Water Bill is $32.1 billion, which is $964 million below the Administration budget request and $88 billion above last year's level. As a result, the bill makes dramatic reductions to vital energy programs to stay within the allocation. While I recognize that difficult choices must be made to address the nation's serious financial situation, and I believe that Chairman Freelingheisen has made a considerable effort to craft a balanced bill, this legislation is severely hampered by the short-sighted nature of the spending cap set by the House-approved budget resolution. The allocation for energy and water is simply insufficient to meet the challenges posed by our energy crisis, the need to maintain our water infrastructure and our national security requirements. That being said, I would like to point out some of the very positive aspects of the bill. I am grateful that additional funds for core nonproliferation activities and vehicle technologies were included. These are very smart investments. The first is vital to our national security as securing, removing, and curbing the spread of nuclear materials is one of the great international challenges our country faces. I would argue the increased funding for vehicle technology is also a smart national security investment. Specifically, the program researches the development of lightweight materials, high power batteries, and hybrid electric drive motors. As the cars and trucks of our citizens and the ships, planes, and tanks of our military rely heavily on petroleum fuels, 
Technology breakthroughs in fuel efficiency are crucial to reducing our dependency on carbon fuels and crucial to improving our national security since so much of our current fuel mix is imported from unfriendly nations. Additionally, I truly appreciate the Chairman's commitment to American manufacturing. This was a theme of many of our subcommittee hearings this year, and he has included strong language in this regard. I believe we need to pull out all the stops to support domestic manufacturing, which remains one of the most important drivers of our economy. Further, I see very little merit to use federal dollars to foster technological advances or breakthroughs for products that are not ultimately manufactured domestically. The bill upholds and continues many of the efforts to improve program and project management at all of the agencies under its jurisdiction. I strongly support the committee in this effort and all the provisions, old and new, aimed at increased oversight and improved project management at the Corps of Engineers and the Department of Energy. I am disappointed, grievously disappointed, that the bill has to carry these common sense provisions year after year after year. And I hope that the agencies begin to incorporate these policies into their management structure. That being said, with a recent Inspector General report detailing egregious overpayments to lab employees by DOE, including an example of one worker receiving a taxpayer funded per diem for more than a decade, I am not optimistic that the message has yet been ingrained in the energy's culture. Where were the auditors? Where was the Inspector General for the last decade? The bill includes continued funding for the Office of Health, Safety, and Security and the Defense Nuclear Facilities Safety Board. These agencies play important roles in oversight of DOE and NNSA projects. Their independent assessment and enforcement are crucial to worker safety and health at these <laughs> facilities. With regards to the Army Corps of Engineers, I am pleased that the bill provides $83 million above the President's woefully woefully inadequate request, ensuring that some ongoing projects will not be terminated. However, the bill provides $188 million less than current year funding. We must invest in our infrastructure by making preventive and proactive investments. Just last year, this bill carried more than $2 billion in emergency funding to respond to natural disasters. I believe this again proves that it makes more fiscal sense to prevent a disaster than to respond to one. Specific to the applied energy programs at the Department of Energy, the bill provides appropriate funding for fossil and nuclear energy, which continue to provide the bulk of our energy needs. However, I am disappointed that renewable energy programs in this bill are reduced by over $400 million from 2012 and nearly $900 million from the President's request. This disinvestment is a serious setback to our energy future. Renewable energy can achieve cost competitiveness, but at this time, a continued and sustained research and development program is necessary and appropriate. Lastly, I would like to express my support for the Chairman's inclusion of funding for the Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Disposal Project and for including the provision to prohibit the use of funding to abandon the project. I agree with him and the other subcommittee members that the administration's actions to close the project run counter to the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of Congress of 1982. In closing, I am pleased that we are considering this bill under an open rule and that the Appropriation Committee continues to function amidst the turmoil that has stagnated so many other legislative efforts. Much of this credit is due to Chairman Rogers and Ranking Member Dix. I commend them for their efforts in this regard. And I would also like to reiterate my sentiments at the beginning of my statement that Chairman Freeling Heisen has done an excellent job and I support the bill we are considering today. I would reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from New Jersey. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm pleased to recognize the full chairman, Mr. Rogers, for any remarks uh, he may wish to deliver and, I, uh, and any time that he may wish to consume. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for such time as he may consume. I thank the chairman for that generous offer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this, uh, this is a good bill. Uh, this is a hard-fought bill. It was, it's a tough bill, and I want to commend uh, uh, the Chairman and the Ranking Member for uh, hard work because the allocation to this subcommittee was not the greatest in the world. 
but uh, Chairman Frelinghuysen and, and uh, Mr. Vesklowski, I think, have done wonders with a uh, short uh, allocation. Uh, funds the Department of Energy, the Army Corps of Engineers, the Bureau of Reclamation, $32.1 billion. Uh, that's a cut of nearly a billion dollars off of the President's uh, request. And within the bill, uh, we've placed the highest priorities on programs that shore up our national security, help tackle skyrocketing gasoline and energy prices, and support American competitiveness. We know this is a bill that can do a great deal to help promote job creation, improve public safety, and regional commerce and help relieve some of that pain at the pump in the future. So we've made those smart investments that will help boost the American economy. Nuclear security programs, as the chairman mentioned, are increased by $275 million over uh, last year. We've made the key investments that are needed to modernize our nuclear weapons stockpile and its supporting infrastructure advance our nuclear non-proliferation activities around the world, and power the reactors that run our Navy, all in order to maintain the safety and readiness of our national defense. To achieve this, the President's request of $7.6 billion for weapons activities is fully funded. In total, non-security spending in this bill is cut $188 million over uh, below last year. Within this non-security category, uh, the committee prioritized programs that support energy security and American competitiveness. For instance, the Corps of Engineers uh, budget contains $83 million more than what the President requested, directing funds to ensure our waterways stay open uh, in support of commerce that will help our economy thrive. The committee also invests in finding ways to help America achieve greater energy independence providing over a billion dollars to strengthen DOE programs to help address rapidly rising gasoline prices. The bill also creates a new shale oil research and development program and promotes advanced research into coal, natural gas, and other fossil energy resources that provide more than 83 percent of our nation's energy. In order to strengthen defense programs and these uh, other national priorities, uh, the committee had to find cuts elsewhere in the bill, cuts that targeted inefficiencies and waste and did the least harm to our nation's infrastructure and competitiveness. We've also cut uh, certain energy programs that aren't as valuable to manufacturing and commerce, and we've rescinded prior year funds wherever possible. I want to stress that we're still able to, find, uh, to, to fund important programs at adequate levels in order to ensure the safety of our citizens and our future economic security. But as we face the dangers of unresolved debts and skyrocketing deficits, we simply cannot fund everything at elevated amounts. We have to cut back, just as families know they have to cut back in these precarious times. As I said, uh, Chairman Frelinghuysen and Ranking Member Visklowski did an excellent job working together as they distributed their 302B suballocation uh, in the most responsible and effective way possible. The subcommittee and its staffs from both sides of the aisle uh, should be proud, as I know they are, of their hard work on this bill. And I want to thank them for the many hours they spent crafting this bill. Mr. Chairman, this is, this is a good piece of legislation. Uh, I think any reasonable person looking at this bill will find that this committee did the very best that they could with the allocation that they have received. It gives priority to programs that boost our national defense, support competitiveness and innovation, and help reduce the volatility of gasoline prices. So I urge my colleagues to support this bill and with that, thank you, Mr. Frelinghuysen, Mr. Vesklowski, members of your committee, subcommittee, and staff for a job well done. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlemen reserves. The gentleman from Indiana. Chairman, I'd like to uh, recognize the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Dix, for such time as he may consume. The gentleman from Washington is recognized for such time.